If nothing else, Kingdom Rush Vengeance is the most divisive of all the Kingdom Rush games. Opinions range from the game being terrible, to the best in the series, to just mediocre, to anything else. Some people have even gone out of their way to make a mod, called Kingdom Rush Revengeance, to make the game closer to the original 3 in their opinion. But even then, different people have different takes on what Vengeance did wrong and what it should have done better. So, do you know just what this community needs? Yet another opinion on what Vengeance should have done differently. But this time, things are going to be different. As a decade-long fan of the series, I have knowledge about Ironhide that will contribute to a better informed opinion of the game's development and how that could have been handled. But first, we need to talk about how the game works, as well as why this is divisive among fans, before we can talk about how it could be changed. To begin, the series started off with a tight formula. You have four tower types, archers, barracks, mages, and artillery. Barracks stood out because, instead of your typical tower defense tower dedicated to slowing enemies, barracks would completely block enemy units. Their blocking power had a lot of depth, because it depended on the soldier's HP as well as the enemy's damage. Mages were the primary source of dopamine in the game. Maybe it's just me, but every time I saw an armored enemy take a hit from a magic attack, it gave me neuron activation. Artillery was the source of AoE, meant to deal with high concentrations of enemies. Archers filled in the gaps that other towers couldn't. They were the best at killing flying enemies, and with upgrades, could be turned into support for your more specialized defense. Speaking of upgrades, each of the four towers could be upgraded three times. The first two upgrades were just stat boosts, while the fourth upgrade gave you two choices. Every tower had two level 4 options, each with their own specialty. So in total, you had eight specializations to choose from in any one level. The games also made sure that you always had something to do while playing. Most tower defense games could be a little mindless while waiting for enough enemies to die to get enough gold to buy the next tower or upgrade you want, but spells existed to let you do something in between those moments. Reinforcements only took 10 seconds to recharge, and they were free to place on the track as extra soldiers to help block enemies. Reign of Fire had a much longer cooldown and packed a big punch to give players something to think more carefully about using. Later installments in the series added a third spell, specific to your hero, to also take into account. And of course, units like barracks and heroes could always be microed during gameplay as well. These were the foundation of three highly successful tower defense games. When Vengeance was announced to be on its way, it had the reputations of these previous installments backing it up. However, the game deviated from the formula in a few ways. The most significant of these is the new tower system. Rather than having four fundamental towers with two specializations each, any single tower would be upgraded to a single specialization in level 4. In fact, the tower was already specialized from level 1, changing very little if anything at all about the way it functions after being upgraded. In any one level, you got to choose 5 towers to bring, compared to the 8 specializations of the previous games. However, players got to pick those 5 towers out of a large list of options. So there were pros and cons to both systems. The Vengeance system had a lot of room for replay value in any singular level because you could come back with a different combination of 5 towers. However, any one level only had 5 towers to work with at a time, whereas the previous games let you use up to 8 unique tower types in any one level. So it could be argued that any one level was less fun to play because there were less tower options within that gameplay scenario. But level enjoyment comes down to a lot more than just tower options, so we'll return to this point later. The main consequence of the new tower system is how it led to Ironhide being able to monetize towers. On the mobile version of the game, the last 8 towers were locked behind paywalls. There was no other way to obtain these towers, even though the mobile versions of the game had in-game currency, gems, which you could also pay real-world money to get more of. Vengeance was a paid tower defense game where you had to pay more to use more of its towers. If there's one way to make players uneasy about your game, it's by monetizing it from day one with in-app purchases. Players already had to get used to the new tower system, which could be seen as a downgrade by some. So, layering that with monetization is only more concerning. But the game is perfectly beatable with free content. By perfectly beatable, I mean without it being a grindy nightmare. Vengeance won't drive you away with a massive difficulty spike in the endgame or anything else like that. That is, assuming you enjoy the core gameplay to begin with. I don't mind unintrusive monetization and can be open to a new system that has its own strengths, but the game itself has to be fun to play. So, 
where did vengeance go wrong, and why? If I could summarize the difference between people who think vengeance is a fine game and those who complain about it, it would be attention to detail. If you care more about the finer details, you're more likely to have a lot to complain about with regards to vengeance. The cracks begin to show as soon as you start trying to appreciate the little details that the previous three games allowed you to take for granted. This game is riddled with a lack of quality of life features, bugs, and some annoying design decisions. Reinforcements actually capture this perfectly, because I can name 6 problems with them alone. One is a design flaw. Reinforcements now have a 14 second cooldown instead of the usual 10 seconds. What I said earlier about having something to do in between purchases to keep the game engaging is now a lesser point in Vengeance because spells charge less frequently. It contributes to an overall slower game. And if that sounds like a minor thing, it is. In isolation. There's more to the game that makes it slower as well, so this is just the first of many contributions to the game being duller. As for problems with the reinforcements specifically, they also have quality of life issues. Something unique that Vengeance tried to do was give you two different options for your reinforcements. Demon Guards were supposed to be tankier and have stronger infernal combustion explosions, while Hellion Tridents had ranged attacks and dealt more damage. However, the game made no efforts to actually encourage you to change between them. For one, you have to reset your entire upgrade tree just to swap to a different reinforcement. But that's the only part of the upgrade tree that is a choice. Everything else can be filled up entirely. So why can't you just respect the one branch that can actually be changed? Any sort of quality of life change would be better than nothing, but nothing is all that you've got. And for a game with a tower system that encourages replay value, it only stands out as even worse that you can't change between them easily. But it doesn't even matter because the game design makes Hellion Trident subjectively better. Demon Guards have a shorter duration of 12 seconds, meaning that they time out 2 seconds before the spell recharges. This is ironic because the reinforcement who's dedicated to tanking lacks 100% uptime. You're left exposed without reinforcements at all for 2 seconds, even if the soldiers don't die in that time. Demon Guards also have worse infernal combustion damage than the base reinforcements, until you get an upgrade to improve it. Oversight after oversight makes Demon Guards seem just plain stupid, but there's something stupid about Hellion Tridents as well. The poison from witches will override other damage over time effects like Jigu's Ice Zone and the burning effect from Hellion Tridents. This is because those attacks are buggy, not the witches. But still, we're listing issues with the game here, and this is yet another one of them. But the biggest elf for reinforcements goes to the final upgrade in their tree, which adds way too much RNG to the game. A 1 in 3 chance to spawn an entire extra unit with stronger stats can drastically alter how effective your strategy is. I've ranted about this before and I'll do it again. This type of RNG makes the game less satisfying because you can't be sure that you won because of luck or actual strategy. So it can be really frustrating to attempt a level or challenge again and be unable to succeed simply because of bad luck. Even more frustrating is when someone else can complete it because they just got lucky and you didn't. This is the antithesis to strategy, especially in tower defense. Another way that this game is antithetical to its genre is with the Soul Point upgrade system. Unfortunately, another L of the game is that, on mobile, you can only have one save file. Since I don't want to reset all of my progress just to get footage of this, you can enjoy this completely unrelated footage of Attack on Titan Wings of Freedom. But anyways, you can earn up to 3 stars on every campaign level based on how many lives you win with. You can earn one extra star from Heroic and Iron Challenges each. In the first 3 games, these stars were used to buy tech upgrades for your towers and spells. In Vengeance, your stars are practically only cosmetic. That's because of soul points. You earn a static amount of soul points after completing each level of the campaign, regardless of how well you did. The reason for this is so that players don't feel so bad about not doing that well on a level. But this wasn't a serious complaint during the lifespan of the previous three games. On the contrary, it's a more common complaint levied at Vengeance for being too handheld and easy. It's way less satisfying to get a set amount of rewards for each level even if you don't have to play better to earn them. It also doesn't help that the points you get after each level are seemingly arbitrary. Jokul's Nest contains a major story boss and gives 4 points, while the next level, Oto Farmlands, is one of the easiest levels in the series and gives 6 points. Meanwhile, Iron and Heroic challenges give 0 points. But now we need to talk about all of the L's that towers take, and there are a lot of these. Since RNG was mentioned earlier, I need to lay in to just how severe the RNG is on tower attacks. 
your primary source of damage comes from towers, yet some of these attacks can have a variance of up to 6 fold. What this means is that the minimum damage a tower can deal is 6 times less than the maximum damage it deals. Think of that. A tower could possibly take 6 times as long to kill an enemy in a tower defense game where the enemies rarely stay in range long enough to give time for that many more attacks. It's especially egregious that most of the variance is on mage towers. Mages have a slow attack speed, so multiplying the number of attacks they need for one enemy results in a significantly larger number. But other towers also suffer from variance and RNG, just to a lesser extent. Upgrading a tower ability resets any progress towards its cooldown. It goes back to the beginning and has to fully recharge all over again as soon as you buy the next upgrade. So instead of wanting to buy upgrades, you're stuck waiting for the ability to be used first. With less to do between purchases thanks to the longer reinforcement cooldown, there's yet another layer of slowness added to the game. Towers are also very samey. There isn't much difference between the Orc Shaman and the Infernal Mage, at least not in a significantly impactful way. Even their abilities overlap, both of them having AoE and a skill that is supposed to stall enemies for longer. The idea behind this design is to allow players to simply use the towers that they like more, but this poses two major problems. The first is that it makes tower choice in your tower defense game arbitrary. It's less satisfying to pick a tower that gets the job done when it doesn't even matter which choice you picked. That's subjective of course, but the second reason is predicated on objectivity. When a tower ends up being stronger than another one, it completely invalidates the other tower due to how much they overlap. Why would I ever use Shadow Archers when Boneflingers and Swamp Things exist? This takes me to one of the biggest L's this game has, which is its balancing. Let's begin with the Crow. This upgrade costs 200 gold per upgrade and adds 2 physical damage per second. An unupgraded dwarf hitting a single target is more cost effective in terms of gold per DPS than the Crow is. Let that sink in. Additionally, this tower has worse damage than Boneflingers and worse range than the Swamp Thing. Rather than being a useful middle ground, its abilities are so plain that the other towers knock it out of the water. Boneflingers will take over the map by spawning unlimited skeletons that can walk to the very end of the map to attack enemies. They also have the best physical DPS of the archers, meaning they take care of flying enemies very well. They have some of the cheapest upgrades and the best cost efficiency. The only downside they could have compared to other archers is a randomly targeted attack, but their short range actually makes this negligible since you rarely get that many enemies in their range to begin with. When you do, it is sometimes extremely useful due to them being able to target casters in the back who have no armor while the front lines are filled with armored enemies. The Swamp Thing is strong in its own right, with huge range and damage, an insta-kill chance on all of its attacks, up to 60% stun chance on all of its attacks, and an absurdly cheap passive that restores 35% of its whopping 3000 HP just for slaying one enemy. Keep in mind that this is a passive ability, meaning that it can always happen and has no cooldown. Blazing Gem and Mausoleum invalidate other mages. Rocket Riders are so cost ineffective, especially with their mines, that other artillery is always better once you unlock it. The list goes on and on. Balance is one thing, but something arguably even more pathetic is how some skills are so bad that they are actively detrimental. For example, any and all damage buffs to the melee attacks of units will be rounded down to an integer. This means that an upgrade that adds, say 40 and then 80% damage, like the Orc Warrior Den has, will be rounded down to give no benefit. 1.4 and 1.8 multipliers get rounded down to just 1, meaning that the Orc's attack damage gets multiplied by 1. Their stats in-game may read otherwise, but in practice, each attack is still unchanged. In other words, buying this upgrade does absolutely nothing but waste gold. But that's just a bug with the code. What about abilities whose design is fundamentally bad, like the Dark Knight's Impervious skill? This ability makes them plant themselves in the ground. They're immune to damage during this phase, but because they're stuck in the ground, they also can't move to block any new enemies if their current melee target dies. Not to mention that they can't even use it outside of melee combat, so ranged enemies will still plow through them. Speaking of invincibility, when the Deep Devil's Reef captures an enemy in a net, the enemy gets free invincibility for those 4 seconds. It can often lead to you wasting spells and abilities. The tower's own Lightning Cloud upgrade is especially susceptible to this, since it needs 5 full seconds to deal all of its damage to an enemy. When elite harassers are revived by Fury of the Twilight, it actually pauses their respawn time, meaning that there's a wider gap between getting your harasser back than before you got the ability. 
Sure, you have a unit in the meantime, but it lacks a ranged attack, and sometimes it can spawn when you don't need it, leaving a wider gap of vulnerability later on in your defense. Gobblerink's bigger ring skill deals less damage than the base attack at tier 1. However, even at higher levels, it is still detrimental to have. This is because the animation for the skill takes 2.5 times as long as a normal attack so it would need to deal 2.5 times as much damage just to even out. Level 3 Biggering deals less than double their attack damage. Many more abilities are still not worth upgrading even though they don't actively harm your defense. The Crow and Mines were already mentioned, but Healing Roots and the Infernal Mage's Teleport are nearly just as weak. The Grim Cemetery's Bloated Corpses doesn't even work on its own units. It only applies to zombies raised by slain enemies, and even then, it can only trigger once every 12 seconds. Probably due to an oversight, the tower can raise zombies from gyrocopters and crystal amphitheaters. Abrasive heat on the melting furnace is simply contradictory to its most optimal placements for damage. Part of this is because of how downright lame so many of the strategic point placements are, which takes us to level design. Before getting to any of this serious stuff, I have to complain about the unskippable cutscenes at the start of many levels. When you begin a stage that has a boss, it usually has what I'm going to count as a cutscene. The boss has at least two speech bubbles saying whatever it is they want to say to the player, but during the time that they talk, the player is unable to do anything. They can't build towers, they can't move their hero, and they can't even click on environmental features. Restarting the level results in you having to watch all of this unfold in its entirety again. The game isn't smart enough to think to skip over the cutscene that you certainly have already seen, and it is 100% certain, because you can't even open the pause menu during these cutscenes. This lack of a quality of life feature is especially sad, because this problem was already solved in Kingdom Rush 1. The boss could still deliver its dialogue at the start of a level, without blocking the player from making any actions. This was perfectly fine, because a player who cares about the story and what the boss has to say will stop and be engrossed in the dialogue naturally. But if they are replaying the level and don't need to see this cutscene again, then they can start building and microing right away. Vengeance seems to not trust the player enough to notice dialogue if there's any possible theme to preoccupy themselves with, so they force them to have to watch the dialogue. This makes it especially annoying if you're trying to do something challenging on a stage. Every restart means that you have to go through this cutscene again. Vengeance in particular may make this problem even more common, since it's possible to enter a level with a hero or tower that you didn't want to bring, forcing you to exit out, select a new loadout, and then sit through the cutscene all over again. At this point, anyone who plays video games should either already know that this is annoying, or not have experienced this at all because designers already know better than to leave that in the game. Now let's get into the real problems. The elite stages are especially guilty of leaving large empty spaces where strategic points could fit but simply aren't there. Sometimes it feels like an artificial restriction to add difficulty, but in a way that limits how much fun you can have with your towers. Many of the strategies you can build are limited to being not very satisfying. That just isn't fun. You can earn unlimited gold in Silver Oak Forest because the spider nest has code in its files to make the spiders that it spawns give the player gold upon death, as if they are enemies. But these are player units, so the game inadvertently rewards you for letting these barracks units die. Speaking of special towers, the game has very, very few special features at all, and even less of them are significant. Origins was the best at this, because every level of the campaign was made special by having a bonus hero, tower, or environmental addition unique to it. Sometimes, there were multiple unique features all in one level. Vengeance, meanwhile, is pretty barren. The mercenary wagon is just reinforcements that you have to pay for, and of course, they're only temporary, so it's not even fun spending gold on them. To make matters worse, you can spawn them before the start of a level, where they can still expire. This is a way to completely waste your gold once again because of a lack of quality of life features. They should either be unavailable or not take their cooldowns until the level starts. But the disappointment for bonus features doesn't stop with just towers. There are no secondary heroes in sight, which I at least could already tell would be the case in the beginning because of the change to the UI. There's no room for a second hero, so I have no hope for one in the future. In the Anurian stages, infusion crystals disable a random tower on the map. So if you let just one of these be activated by an enemy, you're immediately subjected to a significantly impactful RNG effect. In those same stages, you can activate invincibility auras even when no allied units are in range, allowing them to be completely wasted. 
but in the Halloween stages, using the purple gems when no enemies are in range will not activate them. Instead, it shows the range to the player and preserves the cooldown. Why is one of these features smart while the other isn't? The Taoist stoves in the Chinese stages also used to have this issue, but now they're smart too. One last thing about the Anurian stages is how some of the bubble spawners in levels do nothing. These are supposed to be alternate spawn locations for enemies, but because some of them don't actually spawn any units, they only serve to take up space and mislead the player. Of all the criticisms levied at Vengeance, this one is probably the most common. Enemies trickle out slowly instead of coming out in engagingly paced formations. Sometimes, they literally come out one by one with very long gaps between them for minutes straight. Both the campaign and the elite stages are guilty of this, so basically the entire game. Of course, you can find some moments that manage to be more engaging, but the vast majority of the game is plagued with this boring design. Keep in mind that these slow waves are exacerbated by the other elements contributing to a slower game. In spite of the waves being boring and trickling, the game still manages to make them spammy. If you look at this wave in the Dragon King's throne, it's nothing but devoted priestesses. Then, four waves later, there's once again just a bunch of devoted priestesses. You can search the wiki and find waves like this all over the place. There are actually interesting enemy combinations that the game could throw at the player to deal with, but the in-game waves barely utilize their potential. These flaws in the wave design have two additional negative effects on the game. The first is that there's less reason to micro. After all, when the waves are so easy, or at least so slow, there's not much to do while they happen. Frozen hearts are a glaring example of this. They respawn if their soul isn't killed quickly enough. So, you need them to be in the presence of your main kill zone to do damage as fast as necessary. This leads to you waiting for all of the enemies to waddle into range of your towers because trying to attack them ahead of time is pointless. It's so boring. Trying to call the next wave early just leads to getting overwhelmed by enemies, unless you use overpowered paid content to delete everything. The game can be beaten for free, and it's not grindy, but it's incredibly boring. Taking it this slow in order to win might be fun for some people, but for me it's awful. The second negative effect is that it makes certain towers even more useless. In particular, towers focused on AoE like artillery and gobbler ranks simply aren't worth bothering to get. The game boils down to a few towers being the best. Of course, the bad balancing is a problem for the game fundamentally, but the waves being designed to only favor some towers amplifies the poor balancing even further. This also takes me to the negative impacts of Soul Impact. This spell replaces Rain of Fire's big burst of damage on a slow cooldown by dealing a tickle of damage on a slow cooldown. The difference is that enemies slain by this attack can recharge the ability faster. By far, the most optimal way to use the ability is as a finisher, which favors using it on high numbers of weak enemies. If you shorten the cooldown this way, you can use it again very soon if not immediately. This is already pretty annoying as a mechanic, because the RNG of some attacks can completely change how many enemies are killed by soul impact. But what's just as annoying is how using this effectively will make up most if not all of the area damage needed to win a level. Once again, artillery takes a back seat to other options that are more cost efficient, further pushing a meta. Enemies have a number of problems too. For example, some attacks can rob you of an enemy's entire bounty if they modify the enemy's sprite. These skills include frogification from witches, the blazing gem's insta-kill, barisat's insta-kill, and Merglen's targeted insta-kill. Frozen Hearts give 0 gold when killed, but spawn a Frozen Soul that gives 90 gold when slain. But if you insta-kill the heart with one of the aforementioned attacks, it doesn't spawn a soul. So, you've just lost 90 gold because the game doesn't do anything about this unique enemy. And it's not like this is a minor oversight. The game only has so many enemies, so each one stands out. Frozen Hearts in particular spawn quite a lot and are difficult to deal with, Therefore, they stand out even more, making it harder not to notice when these enemies have so many glaring flaws. The Frozen Souls also have my personal least favorite Vengeance L, known as Modifier Immune. Giving an enemy Modifier Immune in the code makes them immune to practically every status effect. This was a coding shortcut taken by the developers to give an enemy immunity to anything. 
the problem arises when the enemy should only be immune to a handful of status effects. Ghosts and souls are supposed to be intangible, so I understand them being immune to slows, poison, and even hot coals. But since they can be damaged by magic attacks, they have to be because that's the intended strategy to defeat them. Seeing them immune to even magical fires but not to being frozen is stupid. And it gets stupider. Carnival dragons are supposed to be immune to slows, but because of the coding shortcut, the only way to give them this property is by slapping modifier immune on them. So now, against all logic, carnival dragons are immune to burning, poison, stun, and more, just because it was necessary to make them immune to slows. Believe you can not, eclipse the sky in Hellfire, for and it won't do jack diddly squat to these like dragons. Games. Not because the they're games, supposed to be immune enemy to fire, could be immune to but because slows, there's no other way in the fire. game to make them but immune in to slows. An enemy either has the immune, immune modifier is the doesn't. only way to give an the enemy immune immunity will make them to invulnerable slows. to slows, yet stuns, somehow, the poison even this attempt at being immune to and possession doesn't work. The immune modifier does not cover damage taken multipliers like shadow mark, teleports, or insta-kills. Hopefully, future Kingdom Rush games are coded with a better engine. However, Mortimus' fear effect works perfectly fine on these enemies. What is the meaning of this double standard? Mortimus and Barisat are both green, so it's not racism. But only Barisat is a dragon, and that's a fantasy race. So I guess it is racism, but just with the definition of race that means species. The other enemy problems are not as egregious, but they have to be mentioned as well. For one, leap dragons used to not check for safe nodes at the exit mid-flight. If you don't know, Nodes are the unit of measurement for paths in this game. Having safe nodes means that there's a certain length of the path in which abilities can't be used. Enemies like Golimons had safe nodes to the exit, meaning that once they were only a certain distance from the exit, they could no longer use their ability to fly. If they began flight and got in reach of safe nodes to the exit, they would immediately land. Meanwhile, Leap Dragons would only check for safe nodes before taking flight, allowing them to safely fly almost all the way to the exit if they took off at the right position. Maybe it was because the developers no longer thought this was unfair enough to keep doing it, but that's not true either. In the last update to the game, the game started checking Leap Dragons for safe notes mid-flight, so we can deduce that it's still considered unfair. That's why it's an L that many other enemies still have this problem. Anurian Infusers can still zap Amphiteers to go hurtling to the exit without a mid-flight check for safe nodes. Also, Anurian Chasers have safe nodes, but can leap onto a different path that is closer to the exit. So even if they have a rule to keep them from leaping too close to the exit, they can bypass that restriction by glitching onto a new path. In Vengeance, all ranged enemies are free to attack units from outside of the actual level's barriers. But allied units can't fight back. So if you spawn reinforcements at the entrance, they'll just be stuck absorbing damage from invincible ranged enemies until they finally die or expire. Speaking of ranged attacks, the chicken farmer has a ranged attack. However, the minimum range for that attack is 180 units, while the maximum range is 150 units. Since no numbers are simultaneously greater than 180 but also less than 150, this attack never gets used. Enemy abilities throughout the series have often been best countered by blocking the enemy in melee combat. This is most common for summoners, who, except for blood ogres, don't have safe nodes, but also can't use their abilities in melee combat. However, blocking enemies in melee combat is a lot more annoying in Vengeance due to the melee engagement rules. On the definitive versions of the games, you could block any enemy of your choice even if they were close to many other enemies. All you had to do was micro your unit or hero to be right on top of that enemy, closer than the rest, and they would target them just fine. However, on the old versions of the games, this was impossible, and it was pretty annoying to work around. Vengeance brings that back by following some strange rules known in the code as normal targeting. Normal targeting is when the first enemy who has spawned is the chosen target out of a group of options. So even if the enemy isn't further ahead in the track, they will still get targeted simply for being spawned first. This makes it more annoying to go after specific enemies at all, because it's probably not even going to work. But even if it does, the attempt might still fail for one of two reasons. One is that, if two or more units are fighting the same enemy, that enemy will use its ability as soon as the first unit dies, even though the second unit should still be blocking it in melee combat. 
The second problem is that units sometimes let enemies walk right by them without even blocking them in melee combat, despite being in range to do so. Heroes also have their fair share of problems. Once Margosa exits beast form, it resets her ability cooldowns, so you can't actually use anything but her basic attack the vast majority of the time. It also is bugged to not expire if she is in melee combat, meaning that she could stay stuck in beast form for minutes on end. That at least creates some semblance of a playstyle. However, it says a lot when one of the most interesting hero playstyles in Vengeance boils down to never using any of her abilities because she's better off as a linear melee fighter. Barisad's passive, Avarice, only applies to enemies killed by his basic attacks. Not only does that make the description of the skill outright wrong and misleading, but design-wise, it clashes with his abilities. Anytime his abilities deal damage, they run the chance of killing enemies, robbing you of the extra gold you could earn from his base attack. He even has an insta-kill, which instantly kills any chance you had of earning bonus gold from his target. A couple of heroes have abilities that they can activate while moving. Olak and Jigu are both guilty of this, which just further discourages Micro. The game automatically uses up these abilities for you, rarely ever at a good, let alone optimal time. All heroes suffer from what is my second least favorite problem with Vengeance, which is that you can't interrupt a hero from using any of their abilities. Well, you can, but if you do, it triggers the cooldown to start ticking even if they didn't manage to execute the ability. The risk of completely wasting a skill whenever you move a hero is such a massive deterrent to micro that I consider it the second biggest L in the game. With slower reinforcement cooldowns, bugged tower abilities discouraging buying them early, and trickling waves, Hero Micro was the last chance for Vengeance to give the players something to always be doing. But this unfixable problem with the code means that even heroes fail to keep the game that enjoyable. Another quality of life issue comes from selling. For some or no reason, tier 4 tower abilities don't count towards the sellback value at all. Even if you haven't called any waves yet, towers with abilities purchased won't sell for their total cost. You have to completely restart the level just to recuperate the money spent on abilities. And since you can't skip intro cutscenes, these two issues compound to be especially annoying. Tesla coils don't have enough range to hit enemies on some sublanes. Since sublanes can sometimes be randomly chosen, this is yet another gameplay factor controlled by RNG. Speaking of RNG, many other soul plane upgrades boil down to just that. The chance for heroes to resist attacks completely or instantly revive are pretty significant when they occur, so luck makes a big difference. Several effects in the game also clash with the design of these RNG mechanics, namely Jack and Grosh's skills. There is also an upgrade that gives mages a chance to deal triple damage, but instead of applying to all mages, it only works on a few. One of those mages is actually the goblin cannon in Jokul's Nest, which is not a mage at all. There's also a lack of new music throughout the game. It stands out a lot when boss fights have no new soundtrack once they appear, a trend that Origin started. The tutorial is a lot more handheld and doesn't let you play any iron or heroic challenges to make a complete map. There are also many distracting bugs. It's basically impossible to beat the game without eventually seeing a sprite get stuck on the screen. Additionally, Enemies can often end up on the wrong path or even going in the wrong direction. If this happens, you may lose a life to no fault of your own. Sometimes, levels just don't end, forcing you to replay it all over again to complete it. That is already unforgivable for a challenging tower defense game, but what's even worse is that the Rise of the Dragon update used to brick your save file, preventing you from even playing the game at all until a patch was released to fix this. That was a long list of problems. I wanted to provide the best documentation possible of the complaints that people have levied at this game, but it could easily be far longer. That's without going into further detail about tower balance. It's without going into detail about the typos and localization issues throughout the game. I didn't even speak about the story and its characters. I didn't dwell too much on the difficulty of the game. All of what I have said has been my attempt at keeping the list as objective as possible. Only the least debatable problems with the game are here. Yet, I bet there is at least one thing I said that somebody doesn't agree with. Maybe these details aren't that big of a deal to you. That's fine. There are a couple of problems that I don't mind that much in this game either. But in conjunction, these problems compound on each other to make the game ultimately worse in a way that I can't ignore. That is why I think the people who like Vengeance just don't care as much about the finer details. 
nothing changes the fact that these flaws are still flaws. It's just a matter of whether or not you let them bother you. Even if I'm not bothered by these flaws, it doesn't make the attention to detail found in the previous games any less special. I consider Vengeance to be the weakest of the four games in the series, and I honestly don't even think the game is worth replaying after the first time, unless it's with the Revengeance mod. That makes the game actually fun. But again, everyone has their own opinions. Maybe you draw the line between worth and not worth playing in a different spot than me. Thinking like that makes it seem like a miracle that so many people can like the same games, but it does happen. That's why Kingdom Rush as a series has had so many fans throughout the years. So how did Vengeance end up with all of these faults that made the game so divisive? Ironically fitting to the series title, the development of Kingdom Rush Vengeance was rushed. That's why the engine has so many fundamental flaws. It's why the game has so many bugs. It's also why features like reinforcements have no quality of life support. It's why levels are designed with so few memorable unique features and have such bland waves. It's easy to say that any game could benefit from more development time, but it's also easy to say that games rarely can get more development time. Game development companies have to keep up with the costs of running a business, adhere to publisher contracts, and other responsibilities behind the scenes. Those factors have the ultimate control over a game's development, so developers have to design around those limitations. At the same time that these restrictions have been getting tighter, games have been shifting from functioning as a product to functioning as a service. Rather than buy a game once and enjoy it in its completion from day one onwards, you buy a game and enjoy its growth and changes as the developers continue to take care of the game. Ironhide almost does this. In the past, it felt like we got the best of both worlds. Not only did they release a full, quality game to play, but they would also add additional updates that brought more levels to play and more reasons to replay the old levels in the form of heroes. The games were a playground, with new toys being brought in every few months to keep that playground fun and interesting. I thought that Vengeance was going to stop having updates after Rise of the Dragon. Ironhide gave us all good reason to believe that, since that's exactly what they said themselves. But then we got Primal Ravage, which actually had pretty positive reception. However, it didn't manage to save Vengeance from inferiority. The best way I can explain why is with a counter example. There is another game also in the tower defense genre, that manages to achieve more of the potential that Vengeance had than Vengeance itself. A game by another indie studio that also happened to release in 2018 and is still receiving updates to this day. And that game is Bloons Tower Defense 6. This game has been in the top 100 most played Steam games of all time for several months. I heard that that's thanks to a popular streamer playing the game and bringing more attention to it. But that attention has stuck around because of the actual quality of the game. Bloons has more towers than Vengeance, each of which have three upgrade paths, and yet it is one of the most balanced games I have ever played. Despite the sheer number of possibilities, it actually has less RNG than Vengeance. And between this roster of towers is one of the most intricate webs of interactions between mechanics and functionality that I have ever seen. Effects can stack in extremely satisfying ways, Pretty much every tower still manages to stand out despite how many of them there are, thanks to how specific their roles are. Taking full advantage of the freedom to make towers into whatever they want, the game has specializations that are focused solely on buffing other towers. You can therefore form strategies centered around buffing a single tower to be as powerful as possible, or focus on a more distributed defense. And how far that distribution spreads can vary hugely while still being effective and successful. It's a game that I keep coming back to again and again, and this is unusual for me, because it has one of the most repetitive formulas I've ever experienced. Every map has the same waves with the exception of two modes, alternate bloons rounds and apocalypse. The other 12 modes play out the same way, just with different restrictions. That means that you will play against the same 40 to 100 rounds 12 times every map. That sounds like madness. And in a lot of ways it is. I believe that pure completionism is what drives people to do this for over 60 maps. Yet I can totally understand doing this for even half of the maps. And that's because the game has so many options and so much depth to the interactions between towers that you can keep using unique strategies and make engaging challenges hundreds of times over. It really has that much depth. 
There are also alternate game modes that are unrelated to completion, like races, odysseys, challenge editor, contested territory, and my personal favorite, boss battles. Part of what makes games fun for me is feeling helpful in a personalized way. Coming up with my own strategy to take down bosses and executing it alongside other people, earning extra money, trophies, and badges for them is the best part of this game for me. I've even made a hobby out of finding low-level players and carrying them in the boss events so that they can get a boost to their in-game resources and maybe learn something along the way. So if you ever want to get carried in a boss together, hit me up. But anyways, this game also has a competitive aspect with these modes, which gives them nearly infinite playability. The game is alive and well for players of many types. Bloons did not start out this way on release. There have been over 30 massive updates to the game, many of which had smaller patches within them as well. The adjustments made to towers and heroes are not solely from the game designer's own minds either. They actually take fan feedback into consideration when making balance changes. It's my belief that some fans can end up knowing a game better than its developers if they play it enough. Maybe that's painful for some developers to hear. Any cases of this being true are probably extremely rare. Nonetheless, I think that Ninja QB shows a lot of humility to hear out what players have to say about their game in such detail. And I think that the success of this method speaks for itself. Like I said, this is one of the 100 most played games on Steam, and there is a substantial amount of players on mobile who add even more to that number. All of this is in spite of Bloons having a rough start on release, as well as not having that much content on release. It even has a formula that sounds so repetitive on paper. And that's what Vengeance has over BTD6. The fundamentals for Kingdom Rush that I explained at the very beginning of this video are, in my opinion, far better than any other tower defense game. Vengeance not only has this great formula, but it also has far more potential than the previous three games. I would go so far as to say that Vengeance had the potential to be by far the best of Ironhide's games, and I'll explain where this potential comes from. The main selling point of Vengeance compared to the other games was how it swapped the teams that the player gets control over. You get to use all the same enemies you fought throughout the series to defeat all the same units you played as throughout the series. Not only that, but with the new tower system, it was possible to add an unlimited amount of new towers to play with. This new tower system would all be worthwhile if it gave the player many fun towers that they could keep coming back to the games for years for. You could also get as many heroes as Ironhide could design thanks to the hero room. So the game had the capacity for years worth of updates, going into as much depth as possible with every faction. In fact, it wasn't even limited to just fan service for the past factions. Most of the updates to Vengeance introduced entirely new content after all. So the possibilities really were endless. So, just take a second to imagine what Vengeance could have been. If the game was released with a versatile, effective engine, it would have the foundation to do so much. It could add so many new effects, which would open the floodgates for hundreds of enemies, towers, and heroes. The developers would listen to fan feedback, taking note of what is imbalanced and what the game could use the most. Every update would bring new balance changes for people to experience. Then. Every new player would hopefully have an even better experience than the last, because they'd be playing a more balanced game. It would also add replay value for older players who may want to feel the differences each change is made. Imagine every several months getting these sorts of tweaks in an ever-growing arsenal of towers and heroes, each one being a fun, inspired representation of the units from the old games. Imagine these updates bringing with them new levels, each with the care and attention to detail that made Ironhide's first three games masterpieces. Imagine having new levels and enemies that utilize the full potential of the world this game takes place in and expand on it. BTD6 stands as a monolith for other tower defense games because of how successful it was without being greedy. All of its content is free. The only things you can pay for are Double Cash Mode, Instant Monkeys, and Monkey Money. You can beat the game without the first two, and you can earn plenty of money by just playing. I imagine it must be terrifying to release a game with so little monetization in this day and age and still expect to run a successful business updating this game for years. But Ninja Kiwi did it. They're still doing it. It makes me think that Ironhide could have too. 
But alas, that's just not the case. Ironhide tried something out, releasing updates that they don't spend that much time on and seeing if it's still successful. Just like how Junk World was an experiment to see if they could release an entire game quickly and still succeed. That's why I've been especially harsh on both of these games. I want the results of these experiments to be clear to Ironhide. Whether or not the current sales numbers agree, I think that these games are not successful in a way that will be felt much more in years to come. They are not as successful artistically, and for that reason, they will not stay in the public consciousness for as long. I think about what each new update will do for BTD6 and look forward to playing it. I don't feel that way about the Kingdom Rush games anymore, though I did used to feel that way for the first three games. I'll never forget how excited I was when Shadow Moon first dropped and I saw how cool Dante and Boneheart looked. I literally grabbed money out of my wallet to give to my mom so I could buy these heroes with her credit card. I can't see myself doing that for vengeance even at that age. So hopefully this model of developing a game can be taken into deep consideration. I don't think that Ironhide needs to literally copy Ninja Kiwi's every move. But there's a difference between copying someone and simply making a smart business decision. It would be a smart business decision to be more receptive to fan feedback and release more patches. It would be smart to design a game with a versatile, functioning engine on release and use that to build on the game with future updates. It's debatable whether or not it would be smart to care for one game for as long as Ninja Kiwi has cared for BTD6, but at least we know that it's worked out for them. I think it's a bit too late for Vengeance to try to reach that potential it had. While that might be depressing, it's not the end of the line. Legends of Kingdom Rush is about one and a half years old, and the main complaint from people besides platform exclusivity was that the campaign was too short. Even with the insane replay value, Fighting the same three bosses at the end of each adventure was just too repetitive. The Wild Moon update helped add dozens of hours of gameplay for me because of how much replay value the party system adds, but then it just stopped getting new content. The arena was a nice idea, but it didn't have the same sense of progression as a campaign. That game really could have benefited from a dedicated team making more updates, utilizing a similar potential to Vengeance in how any past character or enemy could be included. But there's still hope for sequels. Maybe a Legends 2 would expand upon the leveling system to allow for deeper roguelike mechanics, more freedom to make characters and abilities without overly impacting the game's balance, and also raise the replay value exponentially per playable character. Kingdom Rush 5 also has so much potential to be the kind of game that Ironhide has the potential to make. I have spent an unnaturally long amount of time on these games. Most of it was because I was in the right place at the right time. The community is so great that I've stuck around for my friends alone. But I also had an opportunity to experiment a bit with YouTube. I got to see how far I could go with a channel about these games. I would have moved on years ago if it wasn't for my curiosity with YouTube. It feels like I've just about touched the ceiling on that potential now. So unless Iron had releases something that would make the games interesting again, I see myself focusing on other things for the time being, not just balloons but other games that also managed to retain my interest for this long. It's been a slow burn, yet a great ride. Maybe I can hop back on the hype train sometime.